Hey everyone, welcome to that detailed tailstock turret build I promised you all about a year ago. Bringing out my this old Tony hands here. I thought the best way of starting this video might be to show the completed turret itself and start tearing it down and talk point by point about the various aspects of it as we encounter them. And we'll start with the tool holding arrangement. You can see I've got a little knee turning tool and a little die holder held in place currently. And these are the other four clamping rods that aren't currently being used. One thing that was probably obvious from the competition video was that each of these were bored in place along with each of the tool holding bores in the turret itself. As such, if you look real close, each one is numbered on the end. Let's take the knee turning tool out here. Hopefully there's enough light for you to see there, but as the nut is tightened down, the post is drawn up. And it binds the shank of the tool holder in place. Pretty straightforward, probably pretty obvious. As far as manufacturing process, it was really the indexing positions used by this indexing pin here that determined the location of each one of these tool holder bores. Now we'll get into the exact setup that I used for locating and drilling these holes for the clamps but we'll skip that for the time being. If we separate the two halves, this knurled nut here controls the preload, I guess you'd call it, on the tapered uh, bearing that's here. So if you snug this up, the turret really won't move. Here's the tapered bearing. I'll wipe some of the oil off it here. The angle of this tapered bearing and the mating angle in the rear half of the body here were turned in the same setup. Let's show you that right now. First up is this technique that I often like to use for setting the compound angle. It often makes sense to think about these angles in terms of rise over run or X and Y. It makes sense then to get direct measurements of these two aspects of the angle. You can see here that I've set up a square tool holder in my crazy rivet tool post to get a good square reference point. With that square aligned with the axis of the lathe spindle and with two dial indicators set up square to each of those faces of the square tool holder, it makes it pretty easy to get a direct measurement of the X and the Y component of the angle or the rise and the run, however you want to refer to it. And effectively it's trial and error combined with this relative measurement. Very slight tweaks to the compound, increasingly finer, and then testing the travel over both dimensions to make sure they're the values you expect. So in my case here, I have about one inch of travel along one axis, and then I do some math to determine what to expect on the other axis of travel along that compound angle. 
Note that every adjustment of the compound angle requires subsequent realignment of your reference square surface to the lathe axes. You can see here that after every adjustment, I'm having to reset that alignment of the square tool block I'm using. I find that plenty of cussing really helps this process along. Let's pause for just a moment to watch the old Rivette peel some steel. Man, this never gets old. Now getting back to that compound angle. The reason for setting the angle was to turn the cone-shaped bushing for the turret, as well as the mating seat. With a little bit of thinking ahead, I was able to set things up so that both parts could have the correct matching tapers turned without disturbing the compound angle. Here the mating seat is being turned with a boring bar, and now we see the bushing itself being turned with the compound undisturbed but the lathe running in reverse and cutting on the rear side of the work. Obviously you want to be pretty careful running your lathe in reverse taking any sort of cut at all. In this case I was using a collet, but if you happen to be using a threaded chuck, you risk unthreading the chuck from the spindle. This little key right here this is just a piece of key stock that I think was 1 8 square that I filed down by hand. And it's roughly 80 thousandths of an inch square. And I tapered it a little bit to match the keyway here. I didn't get a real consistent um, slotting depth along here. On the rear of this piece, you can see the index pin holes. These six index pin holes were effectively the master for the layout of the, the tool holding bores here. These were laid out on the lathe. I'll show you that right now. I started off just by scribing a simple line that would be the diameter for the hole circle. Next I scribed six intersecting lines, one for each of the index hole locations. To get each of the lines spaced properly, I used a little indexing attachment for the lathe that I made quite a while ago. It screws into the rear headstock oiler port, and it uses the bull gear around the cone pulley to index. The bull gear has 90 teeth, and that's a pretty convenient number for a lot of things. This is the indexing pin, and if you look close you can see it has just a slight taper to it. That allows it to engage with the mating holes just a little bit smoother. The pin itself is riding in a bronze bushing that I pressed into the rear half of the body here. And I didn't show it in the submission video but the little handle for the pin here is just turned from a piece of brass and threaded to, to match the end of the, the pin. Now on the front side of the turret body here, when I was laying out the approximate positions for these bores, really all I had to do was avoid where the indexing pin holes were. I just knew I needed the bores for the tool holders and the bores for the clamping rods to avoid running into any of these indexing holes. The tool holder bores were laid out by installing the partially built turret in the watchmaker's lathe and then indexing it around to each position and drilling very gently with a center drill. <laughs> 
Following that, I used a pair of small dividers to scribe the outer diameter of each of the bores. That was just sort of an idiot check for the setup for drilling the clamping rod bores, just to make sure that everything was sort of where it was supposed to be. Once there was something for layout lines on the front, I was able to use a setup in the mill that let me use these two protrusions on the back of the turret as effectively a reference surface. These two points in conjunction with a stop to register against the side allowed me to return this portion to the vise in the mill to the same point for each of the drilling and counterboring operations that needed to happen for the clamping rods. What that allowed me to do then, again knowing that these index holes were drilled and that we had the index pin in place, was to simply index the front part around to each station, returning the rear body of the vise to the same spot in the same orientation each time, and get good positioning for each of the clamping rods relative to each of the indexing points. A 1-2-3 block bolted to the side of my vise made a pretty convenient work stop. And this scrap piece of hex brass stock registered against those two protrusions I mentioned on the back of the turret to give some repeatable reference surface. And then using an edge finder just to get the right position relative to the fixed jaw of the vise and the edge of the tailstock body. For the actual machining of the clamping rod bores, since they're all offset from the center line of the part, I started by using an end mill to mill a flat to keep the drill bits from wandering off the edge. I then used a pilot drill with a collar around it for a stop, and then drilled to final size. After each of these series of operations, I removed the part completely from the vise and indexed the front half of it around to the next position, returned it to the vise, registered against the stop, and carried on with the next series of operations. And I'm sure you notice my technique for retaining the for retaining the clamping rod blanks while machining the tool post bores here. Yep, that's a big hose clamp. So I suppose the obvious question is, how well does it work? To which I'd answer, reasonably well. This little key's a real son of a gun to put in. I haven't used it for any really serious operations yet. Just playing around and pretty happy with it so far. Very happy with the way the turret itself operates, but much of its usefulness really comes down to the, the, the tooling that is made for it. The knee turning tool I made is really fiddly to get adjusted. It works fine once it's set up properly, but a more refined version of that tool with maybe a fine adjustment by screw for the position of the tool, I think would be really nice. I'm assuming at this point that my main use for this will be making small screws, but who knows, I might be surprised and find that there's uses for it that I didn't anticipate.
Now, I'm calling this a detailed build video, but really it's not all that detailed. I had over 270 gigabytes of raw footage for this project build. The raw footage totaled almost 13 and a half hours. It's an awful lot of video footage and an awful lot of detail that went into it. In the end, I decided it made a lot more sense just to cover the aspects of the build that I thought would be somehow informative or interesting or unusual. So if there's anything I left out that you're curious to see more about, I could follow this up with additional details from the build. As always, thanks for watching.